The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, hit start one. Good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, I'm Kay Hargrave from Auburn University, and I'm looking forward to spending the next 45 minutes to an hour with you, and we're going to talk about the life cycle of an athletic donor. Um, just a couple housekeeping pieces. Um, on your pop-up window of the go-to webinar uh, on the side of your screen, it allows you to input questions. So I'm going to leave some time at the end for us to have some interaction. Um, we're going to attempt to open up everybody's audio capability, so maybe we can speak back and forth. Uh, make sure they can hear you. Let's see. Ask him on chat. Little technical issue. Oh, okay. I couldn't hear you out there. Am I muted now? You should not be muted. Kale, go down to the chat and if you can hear me, just respond to my question if you would.
identified until he or she is thanked for making the gift, and that would be the stewardship piece at the end. But what I love so much about the life cycle um, terminology is that it truly does refer to really a circular relationship. Because if we move a donor, a prospect, through the process in the proper way, then the first gift is often the smallest gift, which also means they're making multiple gifts um, with their time with the institution. So identification would be the first step in the process. And um, I think that at Auburn, um, what we have found to be very beneficial would be referrals from current donors. Um, inevitably, my involvement with NAD over the past eight or nine years, um, what I've found to be consistent across the board, no matter the institution, is the unique relationship that athletic departments, specifically athletic development units, have with university development. And I would just encourage you to cultivate that relationship as best you can and really be participatory in their meetings and also the policies and procedures. You know, however it is that your university has aligned the athletic development piece, whether you report up through advancement or you have a dotted line to advancement or you have zero relationship outside of what you yourself and your unit have chosen to, um, to really make important, I would just encourage you to get to know the deans, get to know the vice president of development or vice president of advancement and also those development officers um, because they oftentimes can be the key either to you being able to get in the door or even prohibit you from being able to get in the door. Um, we do not have graduates in the athletic department and at Auburn the way that those assignments are made, uh, graduation is how it's determined. So we really have spent a lot of time over the last decade um, cultivating the relationships with development officers. We put some deans on our athletics advisory council we have really tried to build relationships there um, almost before, you know, even um, attempting to build one or, or contact somebody from their college or school, and that's really been beneficial to us. I'm going to talk a little bit later about the importance of um, focusing on internal as well as external relationships um, because those key people on campus can really help you as you move uh, either a donor that has dual interest along or one that is just specific to athletics. Uh, we have a university research office in the Office of Development and they often produce prospect lists um, to the various constituencies and athletics from time to time. Um, different wealth screenings have been done on those and you know I hear various opinions on really the uh, value that people find in that. Um, I think that any information is better than no information, so I would encourage you to utilize your research office on campus if there is one. And if you have somebody in your office who that's sort of their, uh, their little niche is research, and we do have a lady in our office that has really, um, she enjoys really perusing the internet and looking into these prospects and donors and, and figuring out something that we would not have known otherwise. So if you have somebody and that's one of their strengths, I'd encourage you to really let them um, sort of walk that out because she has found several of the seven-figure gifts that we've secured in the last two years. Um, screenings of database I think is important. You know, once you know exactly how your university uh, screens the database, you can piggyback on that with your ticket data and again I think pick out some trends as well as geography um, geography points that may be of, of use for you as you're trying to decide your travel. But I do want to emphasize this, no matter um, the prospect list, the screening, always face-to-face -face, uh, qualification I think is, is the most useful. Um, and if I had to rank the top three bullet points, referrals from current donors have been um, the most valuable for us at Auburn because we always make sure 
that we have obviously an objective whenever we are in a meeting with a prospect or a donor, especially a current donor, and my question to them is, I would like for you to give me two to three names um, of your peers or your running buddies or whatever it may be. Um, they don't have to necessarily have personal knowledge of, of the referral, but it would be helpful if they had a clear understanding from you sort of the threshold of wealth that you're looking for. And so it would be something like this, you know, I'd like, I'd love for you to give me two or three names, and it doesn't have to be right now, but really spend some time thinking that has an affinity for X, Y, and Z program. And um, if you'd be comfortable making a phone call on my behalf, or if not, um, just provide me as much information as you have about them as possible. The reason I focus on two or three is because if you ask for them to give you a list, sometimes the list is a little watered down as you start to work through it because they're focusing more on quantity rather than quality. So two to three um, referrals that, that would be in, in the equivalent range as the current donor that you have, and that's been really helpful for us at Auburn. And then the last bullet point, utilize technology. I think that over the past decade, um, we are currently in the second capital uh, comprehensive campaign in the athletics department in Auburn. And, you know, in the first campaign, we called it low-hanging fruit. And um, thankfully, we had built some good relationships with our current ticket holders um, and already had that, that working in our favor because we were not very savvy um, as far as really the fundamentals of how to really go about identifying prospects and then moving those through the donor cycle to, to secure a gift. Um, but technology really didn't come into play as it does now a day. And I think that, you know, press releases, um, you can really almost find anything in a Google search on somebody with regards to a press release or through a business magazine. That's one of my favorite things to do when I'm in Atlanta or Birmingham where our two largest concentration of donors or are, are alumni are found is to pick up one of those business magazines in a hotel or in someone's office. And it's amazing how many people in those top 10, top 50 rankings um, you may find that had never um, come up in one of, your, one of your reports before or one of your referrals from a current donor. Just yesterday, I was fortunate enough to have lunch with a former football player from Auburn who lives in Birmingham now, and uh, we were discussing a, a gentleman that he has built a relationship with, and he could not believe that we didn't already know this gentleman. He's the number two person at one of the most successful um, companies in Birmingham, and uh, it just goes to show that the, while it seems sometimes that our prospect lists um, maybe are not as populated as we'd like for them to be, or our portfolio is not as populated as we'd like for it to be. Um, even after 15 years, I'm being you know, introduced to a new um, potential donor who ha who's affluent and influential. So I just encourage you to you know, never uh, stop utilizing the, the relationships you already have. And then lastly, social media. Um, our ticket holder population in Auburn is um, is I want to say the average age is like 67, 69, and so we're going to have a big, um, you know, generation shift in the next decade or so as far as who our who our donors are going to be and who we'll be targeting. But when we went from um, paper uh, ticket priority information and you know most of our information that we provided people as a hard copy, we moved to electronic communication. We really had a little heartburn about that um, because even, you know, some of my closest uh, donors that I would run things by, um, they didn't have uh, much use for the Internet and maybe a little bit with email. But over a two-year period, we really streamlined all the way to only electronic communication. And it's amazing how I want to W-A-N-T base T-O really plays into um, how people will gravitate towards what is put in front of them. And um, I think that we now are 100% electronic as far as our ticket communications um, go, and we'll be moving that way with that, even our pledge payments um, and that type of thing. So I just encourage you, social media I think will, will be one of the areas where we see the most change and growth 
in, in the next decade, um, five years even, because I, I continue to think that no matter really the age range, people will continue to get more and more comfortable with Twitter, Instagram, um, and even Facebook. Okay, so the stages of the life cycle. Um, the first is identification that we just discussed, and the second would be initial contact. And the initial contact, um, you know, obviously would, would look like um, a meeting in somebody's office or in their home, um, a coffee meeting, whatever, where there's a clear objective to the meeting. And you'll hear me say that several times a day, that having an objective, I think, is what enables the life cycle to really be fluid and also um, for you to really stay on target because, as we know, um, athletics is a, a social, um, a hobby type of function for our people, and sometimes the lines get blurred between um, a social experience and really the business piece of it. Um, and if you, like we were at Auburn, are looking for ways that you can move from more of um, a, a direct mail um, or a, you know, a, a ticket exchange um, you know, type of deal to more of a philanthropic focus, then I would encourage you to really stay focused on having an objective for each encounter with your donor. And that can mean in person, um, via email, or on the telephone. So it really lies on us, though, as the development officer to be intentional about that. So with the initial contact, we always, and I talk to my staff about this, we always um, are wanting to do three things in that meeting. And the first one is, let's just get to the next meeting. Okay, so obviously you're not going to say that whenever you head in the meeting, but um, always keep that in the back of your mind. The main goal of that initial contact is, in fact, to get to the next step. Um, secondly, I believe you can, based on the individual, start exploring um, what that person's interest level may be. Um, and interest area may be. Um, so use some of the exploratory questions um, and also, thirdly, find out a little bit about them personally. So what I mean by that is, um, do they travel a lot? Do they enjoy um, coming to football games and away games? Do they ever come to basketball games? What do they like to do with their family? So that would involve a little bit of investigation on the athletic preference, but primarily um, you know, what kind of expendable income do they have? And you've heard this over and over, I'm sure, with, with your time in development, but listening is so key. And um, I think that asking questions, open-ended questions, you can learn so much in that first meeting. Um, and also, obviously, at the end of that meeting, you're asking them um, if you could follow back up with some more specific information. And after the person, he or she, agrees to that, I always ask, um, you know, what time frame would you like for me to follow follow up with you? Because the more you get them to volunteer to you, the better chance you have of getting back in. So um, if I think a month is enough time and not too long of a time, but they're expecting to hear from me in two weeks, well, they're not going to be very happy when it's been twice as long as they had hoped. Or if they would like to sort of delay, not, real, not necessarily delay, but um, they're a little more deliberate as they make decisions and um, set meetings or the calendar's extra full and they travel a lot, then if I'm calling that next month, um, it has a tendency to maybe be a little too ambitious. So really defer to them on their comfort level of um, when the next follow-up would be appropriate. So I mentioned the next steps and then we'll delve down a little deeper into each one. Um, cultivation would follow initial contact and that looks different um, really for each donor. And I think that that is um, one of the ways that we can maximize um, their, giving, their giving is by figuring out what their, what their hot buttons are, but also their level of involvement. Um, are they already involved? You know, how much do they already know? Um, and so that will dictate how long that cultivation process goes on. And you're really, I think, a good development officer is spending a good amount of time really educating the donors. And we'd be surprised at how many um, things they really don't know. And I'll just give you an example. We do a lot of um, surveying here at Auburn. And I'm thankful for that because oftentimes, you know, as development professionals, we are the ones who really have the most contact with external 
um, groups outside of the, the walls of our building or maybe even our campus. So um, we really have value, I think, to bring back to the table and share with um, whomever your immediate supervisor is, athletics director, vice president of advancement. But uh, we do a lot of surveying in Auburn. And one of the things that we found in the survey uh, that really surprised us because we spend a lot of time um, really promoting and uh, sharing information about our graduation rates of our student athletes, um, their academic uh, progress and, and different achievements. Um, we've had several Rose Scholar finals in the last few years um, and all of our trends have moved significantly upward in the past decades. So we spend a lot of time um, sharing that through all of our various communication pieces, both electronically and hard copy. So whenever we surveyed um, our people, one of the lowest uh, ranked topics that they felt that they knew about was our academic um, performance. And that really is one of the things that we, I think, share as much, if not more, than anything. And so what it told us is, that we were not providing that information in a way that it was being received or consumed by our people. And at the same time, um, we began really looking at uh, how are we utilizing um, our own messaging and how, how are we making sure that um, we are getting out the message that we think we are getting out to our people. And we hired um, a couple of writers from the Birmingham News, which at the time is the largest newspaper in Alabama, and they came on staff for us. And they would also report things that maybe weren't um, so pleasant or weren't um, the positive you know, message that we wanted to get out because we needed people to understand that they were in fact neutral. But what it also did is these two guys had a huge following really across the country, but especially in the southeast and in Alabama. And so they had credibility. And when they would share and when they would write, people every morning when they would get up would be, you know, reading their blogs or reading their articles already. So when they came on staff for us, it was a natural transition for people to then um, move with them and start reading them from our website. So we really took ownership of um, crafting our own message, and it paid off dividends. Um, at the same time, we were at the bottom of the SEC, if not the country, with our Facebook. We had zero Instagram presence, no Twitter presence, um, and really hired a few key people who that's their area, area of expertise and um, made sure that our messaging was consistent and our Instagram, Twitter, and uh, Facebook presence went to the top quarter of the SEC and the top 10 in the country in a couple of those um, rankings over a, about a three or four year period. So I think that that was one of the best moves we made communication wise because while we were putting out uh, the message we wanted our people to, to have and to know, um, they weren't, we were not providing that to them in a way for them to receive it. Um, the way that they had a preference to. So I think that we've, we've made a lot of strides that way and now we even have a communications department in our department that focuses, in our athletics department, that focuses only on messaging, PR, um, crisis communication, um, and that type of thing. They also work with us, however, to make sure that we are all communicating the same vision and that's where that piece of educating in the cultivation process is so important. Um, when we first began major gift fundraising um, in the previous campaign, it was, a, it was the first time that we had ever had a unified effort. Um, our staff grew, we had extensive training with the J.F. Smith group and who's providing this webinar today and we learned that we could not start asking our people for money, even those that have been in the ticket program for 20 and 30 years, until we educated them about why we needed the money. And so many times I think we in athletic departments, because the demands are so strong and the competition is so fierce, that we take for granted um, that our people know what our challenges and opportunities are as well as we do, and they don't. So I encourage you during that, edu that cultivation process to really use that as um, an educational time, not just for yourself to find out about them, but also to educate the donor um, which may in fact influence 
the area that they choose to support. I'm going to go ahead, but we're going to come back to this slide um, just so I can refer to it in just a moment. So the cultivation, the number of visits varies by prospect, as I mentioned. Um, but always keep in mind that, you know, we want to be just slightly um, faster paced than the donor. Um, in other words, don't let them draw out the process, you be in charge of that while being respectful to their, um, to their time frames that they've laid out. And we do run at a faster pace, I believe, than the academic areas. Um, so, again, that's where the cultivation of those development officers on campus is really important because we have really tried to build that bridge to say to them, you know, please, you're welcome to join us. Um, we oftentimes can get in the door easier than the academic side can. Um, so building those relationships so that they are looking forward to maybe a faster pace rather than slowing the pace down for you I think is important. Um, majority of fact finding is done in the cultivation stage, as I mentioned, um, and examples could be a lunch or coffee with a coach, um, a phone call from a former athlete, uh, team travel, um, access to practice, an invite to a members only event so they get a taste of what that, that would be like if they did join at a certain level, and then recognition of that prospect or a family birthday or anniversary. I think it means so much to people. Um, when we remember those little personal things. And I heard in a presentation not long ago, you know, the, the word that people want to hear and value more than anything else is their own name. So recognizing them and also unique dates specific to them, I think, will really set you apart um, from probably other people that may be calling on them. Um, I'll touch on some of these whenever we get to the stewardship piece, but um, I would encourage you as you're looking at maybe involving coaches and also access to practice. And it may be different at your institution as far as what will be deemed an exclusive, um, an exclusive invitation. But I, I would tell you, I generally um, now use those more as a I listed them here because um, obviously there are different opinions of where this love is game, but I would probably a little taste like the box that I want to enjoy the full benefit. Interactions and invasions that really cost you a true key. Um, at Auburn, a few years ago, we had a coaching staff that was going to with our donors. Um, that press was open to all um, anyone they wanted to attend. And so, really, coaches would just be the two maybe that I would star um, as, you know, really think about do I want to use that for stewardship or for cultivation. Some keys to cultivation, um, under promise and over deliver. I think that's so important. Um, follow up to a meeting, um, of course you're going to hear this um, for all the years that you're in development and fundraising that a handwritten note is still so important. Um, and I agree with that. And I know as your tenure at an institution um, lengthens and your portfolio grows, that that becomes harder and harder. Um, and I don't want to encourage cutting a corner, but as any first impression is the most important, I think that also um, lends itself to be true on the handwritten note piece. Um, 
uh, most of my donors text or email now and they prefer that, but um, it's surprising how a handwritten note, even on a standard thank you letter um, or a standalone handwritten note just out of the blue really still impresses them so much and they're, they're good about sharing that. Um, another, another comment on the handwritten note, I think utilizing a student athlete um, is really a nice touch and also involves them in the process. Um, we hired some football players in Tiger Unlimited um, back in the mid-2000s. It was amazing that just to see them as they too were educated about exactly what it takes for them to receive the scholarship they received. They were blown away by um, the amount of money, A, that people would spend to come watch them play football. And then B, um, the number of people that had been in the program for so long, and this was really their, um, their family uh, outing or tradition, and it really, I think, struck, struck a positive nerve with them that um, Auburn really is what they were told on their recruiting visits, and, and they began to see that there really is a family environment. So whatever that may be at your school, um, whatever sport, um, or if you have a team, um, for example, our softball team, we're going to be utilizing them um, in some phone calls and some, and some note writing. I think all of those um, are good not only for the donor, but also in educating your student athletes. Okay, so back to cultivation keys. We don't want to let this stage drag out too long. I know I've mentioned that three times, but that is the one area. Um, if there's two pieces that I think can become an issue um, in the development field is to let the cultivation drag out too long and then to not have clear, concise, effective solicitation follow-up. Um, I'll get into that in a minute, in a minute but don't let, this, don't let this stage drag out too long. And then always be clear. Um, not only in your mind, and you don't have to be forceful with this, with the prospect, but business versus friendship. Um, especially in the South, um, things are really social here, and um, our donors are very social people, and obviously people give to people, and so we are building those relationships with them, but it's so much better, I think, and um, benefits you as well as them to handle the business first, and then the friendship can develop after that. Um, like I mentioned, the first gift is often the smallest, and if we steward them the right way, then it will be the first of numerous gifts. Um, and I just encourage you because, again, as portfolios grow, um, it is harder to keep up with uh, the process, and that's why we refer to it as the cycle. You know, where is everybody in the cycle? and not to forget those that are in the stewardship piece of the cycle because they will again be in the cultivation and solicitation piece again if we handle the stewardship right. And just as a word of encouragement and maybe slightly motivational um, tip, it takes seven times the amount of money to secure a new donor as it does to retain the one you have. So when I heard that, um, I took a slightly different approach to maybe a couple ticket holders who um, weren't happy with the hamburgers and hot dogs um, because seven times the amount of money is, it can get very high very quickly. Um, maintain the most exclusive benefits for actual donors. Um, so I mentioned that coach interaction, I think, and then exclusive um, activity, whether it's practice, team travel, whatever that may be, I think it's so important to um, maintain those exclusive benefits primarily for your donors. And we have a tiered system here at Auburn that's developed over the last decade. Um, and I'm going to give my information to you all at the end so that if you would like to see um, really what our benefits uh, chart looks like. This isn't really a public document. We use it more as a talking piece in meetings. Um, and it's not an all-inclusive list, but it does show clear delineation between the various recognition societies to show the value um, of, you know, their consideration of move from one society to the next. Um, and then always have an objective for how each contact is moving the prospect closer to making the gift. In other words, 
let's just say you're in your second cultivation meeting. So now you've identified the donor, the prospect, you have um, had your initial contact with that prospect, and you're in the second cultivation meeting. So this will be your third meeting. Ideally, um, and sometimes it helps to make a checklist just to make sure we're on point and moving people along um, and don't go off on a rabbit trail. Um, that, you know, here's what I want to accomplish in the initial meeting. I want to ask for another meeting. I want to learn a little bit personally about this prospect as well as what their interest areas and level is currently with the institution, with the athletic department. Um, secondly, in that first cultivation meeting, you will be delving in a little bit more, drilling down a little bit more as far as what their interest areas may be. And then also that would be a good time to explore if they do in fact, if they're a graduate or their spouse is, if they do in fact have an interest in an academic area. Um, so we've checked that box one way or the other. So the second cultivation meeting, if they are um, interested in an academic area, that constituency could send somebody to come with you or you could provide further information about both areas academically and athletically in that second cultivation meeting. Because ideally, and this might seem a little fast, but ideally by that third cultivation meeting, um, we should be asking them if we can, in fact, bring a proposal. Now, the larger the gift, the more it might um, draw out that cultivation process because we want to make sure that we've got all of our um, answers to key questions and all the people involved that need to be. I'll get into that with the solicitation. But um, I think it's important just to always have an objective for how each contact is moving the prospect closer to making a gift. So now we're back to the moves management terminology. Um, and lastly, in each meeting, whether it's initial contact or the cultivation, solicitation, or stewardship, always ask their permission for the next meeting and what kind of time frame they would like for you to follow. I think it's so important and really gets them bought into the process. So cultivation actually looks like um, really what uh, the prospect determines it looks like and what you have found um, to be beneficial for you as far as what projects you're raising money for, um, the timeline you have to work within. You know, is there a, a, a sense of urgency or a deadline, um, a campaign nearing an end, a campaign going public from the silent phase, um, a certain facility, an indoor practice facility that needs to be constructed by X amount of time, a stadium renovation, um, some sort of endowment program. So that the cultivation is going to look like um, really what your prospect has you know, shared with you and the time frame that they sort of allude to. But then also on your end, um, it's going to look like the time frame and the projects that you have to put before them. So when do you know that it's time to move from cultivation to solicitation? Um, I really think that identifying these clues uh, differentiate between average or good development officers and great development officers because inevitably there will be people who um, will ask you in the first meeting or two maybe even the first meeting, um, you know, what are you here for? What do you want to ask me for? And we have to be comfortable in, A, not answering that question um, unless we're really backed into the corner in the first or second meeting because oftentimes um, we call it a go-away check. We may get a go-away check or a go-away pledge. So any way that you can um, just encourage them to continue the conversation I think will help you. Now, at the same point, um, it may sound like I'm talking a little bit of, out of both sides of my mouth, but um, because we don't want to draw out the process, um, which is the second point in, in fighting the urge to over-cultivate. Um, I think that once um, the relationship moves more from business to personal or business to you know friendship, at least in their minds, it's so hard with that first gift primarily to move it back to business. So. Um, I really encourage my staff to reserve uh, lunch and dinner meetings um, for later in the process as more of a stewardship uh, piece and to really conduct the first um, few steps of the donor cycle um, in their office um, where it's very clear or in their home with their, with their spouse present where it's very clear that it is about business. Um, and I think that that also really raises your level of professionalism 
um, in what can sometimes you know be a really social um, relationship that'll develop because of the types of activities that that we all do and we all have with our donors. Um, and I have to tell you that once you go through that educational process with them, where you you've taught them about what your needs are, what your opportunities are, as well as um, the vision and the mission of your athletics department and your fundraising arm, that um, asking really is addictive. And so you have to balance between, um, and a really good development officer can't wait to ask. So we talk about that in our meetings, our strategy meetings we have with our team, um, that we have to sort of dial it down um, sometimes because um, you want to be aggressive, okay, and 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 be um, very good at moving the process along. But I think the best development officers can't wait to ask and are good at that specific step. Um, I'm going to address a few things about the solicitation that I do think is um, a science and it's proven out to be true over the last 15 years for me. But um, I would just I pose the question to you to ask yourself, you know, do I enjoy asking for money? Because how many times have we been um, in church or at a dinner, a banquet, um, and the very person that is making the solicitation or the ask, they start off the whole thing with, I really I don't like to ask for money. I'm really not good at asking for money, that kind of thing. Um, so inside, you know, does that really um, appeal to you to build a relationship? identify a person's area of interest, engage accurately really the range um, for the ask and then the actual ask itself. Um, because for me that was really how I knew that I had, had landed in the right field is that I, I loved asking for money. I still do. And then you also know it's time to move from cultivation to solicitation when all your questions have been answered, all your exploratory questions. So the who, you know, um, who are they, what are they interested in. Um, also, who should be present. So who, who is the prospect, what are they interested in, but also who should be present for the ask. Um, and I think that it's important um, to make sure that the donor has, the prospect has a comfort level um, whenever they have agreed for you to bring back a proposal. And I'm going to go into this a little bit more, but we always want to ask their permission, just like asking their permission um, for the next meeting in each of the stages. I think that it's very important to ask their permission to bring back a proposal. And when you do, um, you want to have all these questions answered, really every question except the exact dollar amount. Um, so I would like to bring back um, the president of the institution, the athletics director, and the head coach from X, Y, and Z sport. And they're going to let you know if they're comfortable with that or not. Because I learned this from the hard way. And um, I had my biggest ask to date. Uh, it was around the LSU game. Um, it was my second year in the development unit. And the head coach and a former head coach were present with me when I brought the couple into the, the room of the stadium. And they were shocked to see um, the head coach and the former head coach. And I also had not done, they were pleasantly shocked, but I also had not done enough exploratory work on the range of the ask. And I mean, it taught me that, you know, it's really the onus is on me, not them to volunteer, um, because it generally will be a little lower when they're the ones that are volunteering it, the lower amount. But the onus is on me to discuss um, the projects as well as the gift range. And that can be done directly or indirectly. Um, I think it's really important to find your own style with that. Um, you know, as I mentioned, this is a people business. And um, we build relationships by being trustworthy, um, keeping our word, following through on things, and then also um, being genuine. And so that's going to look different for each one of us in how we go about getting our questions answered and being the best version of me that I can be. You be the, the best version of you that you can be, not like anybody else on your team or um, from an academic constituency. You be the best version of you that you can be. And then, as I mentioned in the box below, in, at the bottom, always ask permission to bring a proposal. So the details of the ask, um, I think this is so key. Um, you're going to review the who, what, why, when, and where background with the soliciting team. 
So um, if you are all riding in the same car, if there's two of you on the team, if there's five of you on the team, or if you are the only member of the solicitation team, you'd be very comfortable with um, the proposal, um, why it's in fact composed the way that it is, um, make sure that the prospect um, has the opportunity to include their spouse or other family, and um, also that each member of the team don't ever assume that um, their comfort level would be close to that of yours because it's, it surprises me still how many university presidents or coaches um, are not, they don't have a great comfort level. They can speak to thousands of people at a time, but once the asking for money piece comes in, the comfort level seems to decrease. So it's really on us to make sure that they feel good about um, their information that they have going in, um, and then also about how the, the specific ask will flow. So the five steps of a solicitation, and this is what I think um, really is uh, more of a science. Um, we learned this early on um, in our work with the J.F. Smith Group, and it has proven true over and over again. And early in my career, this really gave me a comfort level um, as I was talking to uh, people that were generally a good bit older than me, um, and I really had not interacted with people of quite the magnitude um, as I was, and then asking them for huge dollars amount, dollar amounts. Um, this five-step process for the ask really gave me a comfort level going in um, to know that I was consistent, I was intentional, and then no matter who was joining me for the solicitation, I always would review this with them. I would make the assignments, I would review with them. Um, the small talk, the bring it to business, the reason for the ask or the project, the specific ask, and then scheduling the follow-up. And so each person in the room is gonna have a role. And if there are more than five people on the solicitation team, um, two can speak in the case for the ask. Um, two can speak in the follow-up, but primarily, everyone can speak in the small talk, but primarily one person um, can bring it to business, and that's just a simple statement of thank you so much for your time today, and we are here because. Um, and then for the ask, I think that that is the most important um, piece of this whole cycle, um, because there's two parts to this that I think are so key. Number one, um, you want to be very clear and concise in what you're asking for. So, Mrs. Jones, um, I would like for you to consider, or we would like for you to consider, based on the composition of the room, um, a $50,000 pledge over a five-year period, payable in equal amounts of $10,000 a year, to support the student athlete scholarship with the women's softball program, and then be quiet. And that 15 seconds of silence can seem like 15 minutes, but one of the best rules of thumb that I ever have heard in this business is he who speaks first loses. Because once you put that dollar amount out there and you're specific, um, and it's amazing how many aren't comfortable saying the dollar amount. So I just encourage you, if you have to talk in your rear view mirror and your mirror getting ready in the morning, just get comfortable with that one sentence that lays out um, the project, the pledge amount you'd like for them to consider the gift, and then the timeline for the actual pledge, um, and then be quiet. Because the only thing that can happen if we are the first ones to speak is that we're backing off of what we've asked them, um, which essentially gives the, the prospect an out, and I think also um, minimizes really our, our professionalism with this. So it takes a strong person to be able to sit in a room and um, make a solicitation and then be quiet, but I think that again is what separates good from great. And then be specific with your follow-up. Um, you want to review the roles prior to the meeting and allow plenty of time for all of the members of the solicitation team um, to ask questions and, and for you to clarify anything that they may need. I touched on a few of these already, but I think what takes you from maybe not so good to great is for the prospect to have approved the, the presentation of the proposal. They're not surprised by who's there joining you, and they have an idea of the pro proposal amount and a comfort level um, with their input about the ask, 
the ask amount and also the project. Um, not so good if we go in there and leave a proposal but we've not discussed the dollar amount um, or they're surprised again by who's in the room or worse yet that you even have a proposal with you. The, the solicitation follow-up so is key um, and ideally concise and this I would have to tell you in full disclosure um, is probably my least favorite piece of the process. Um, now, in saying that, I've only gotten an answer twice in an actual solicitation meeting, so it's not very common um, that, that you do get your answer. But what I mean by my least favorite part is the solicitation follow-up, if I have not done my homework or I'm not specific with my follow-up in the scheduling of it or in the questions, my objective as I am following up, it can draw on for some time. And as we all are wired, um, the asking is addictive, but even more so is getting that check or that pledge card. And so I think it's so important to really um, stay focused on the solicitation follow-up um, and borderline aggressive with that. Um, so you want to email and, and have a handwritten note of thank you, um, confirm the agreed upon follow-up time. Um, Go ahead and schedule that meeting, even with the assistant before you leave, if that's possible, and then repeat those steps as needed. Um, keep a checklist on your calendar just to make sure that um, nothing slips as far as those steps, and also that if it is taking one or two meetings or one or two phone calls for the follow-up, that you have um, it noted on your calendar so one doesn't, like I said, slip through the crack and, and you realize, oh my goodness, I still don't have an answer, and I made that solicitation three months ago. Um, and then the, the iPad at the bottom is a great resource, I think, um, as you are moving through the questions um, for the follow-up. You know, it stands for um, in individual, all right, project, um, amount, and time. So am I the problem? You know, have I not done something in the follow-up or with somebody else? And the, has there been any case with an individual? Or um, is it the timing of the individual that we're speaking to? Then the project. Was I off on the project? Was I off on um, um, in something in the proposal? The amount, obviously. And then also the timing. Is it just not the right time? Because often you'll get a no. It really means not right now. And I would always encourage you, if you do get a no, um, to move that discussion into um, sort of, you know, exploring if, the, if another time is more palatable. Are they working on their um, estate plans? Is there any, um, you know, any sort of uh, bonus that may be coming in in the final quarter? So there's various ways that you can look into that, but always keep in mind, you know, is it the individual, is it the project, is it the amount, or is it the timing? So in your stewardship, um, you want to have at least five touches a year. Um, and I think these would qualify as personal touches um, because you are doing these yourself. So this would not include um, invitation to whatever uh, events you may be having or uh, recognition society benefits. The invitation at the bottom for me would refer to an invitation for them to join me somewhere. So it would be me and, and the, the couple um, maybe at uh, some other sort of um, gala or, or event um, that is not athletic department specific. So keep in mind um, the greeting cards, the visits are so important um, in thanking that donor. And it's amazing how even the donors that have, are now in their third or fourth major gift um, that I've known for almost 15 years just a call out of the blue from them for, to them is so meaningful and, and it really is, um, it's a good thing to remember and I think it, it sets you apart from some other organizations that are probably calling on them that they contribute to. Um, does your university have donor societies? Um, I would pose that question and then is there a need for a society specific to athletics at Auburn? There are a few donor societies um, on the university side, and they include ticket priority contributions and plan gifts. 
Um, we recognized quickly that we needed to form a society in athletics um, that was specific to outright giving outside of tickets because um, for so long our our giving had primarily been for ticket priority. So I'd encourage you, um, and I know we're getting short on time, so I'm going to just touch on this briefly and then open it up for any questions. Um, focus on ex exclusivity, so access over expense. Um, I think that especially as budgets are cut um, and as our donor um, our donor groups grow, that you know cost increases. So access and exclusivity um, is key, and we can we can walk that out a little further. Um, hopefully, in, in a future webinar with with stewardship and what those donor societies look like. Um, so I would encourage you find out as much as you can about your university donor societies and ask your donors that are already in those, you know, what do they like about it and what do they not. Um, our donors, uh, when we at Auburn, when we decided to form the All-American Society, we went to a few key donors and said, you know, what would you like this to look like? Because it really doesn't matter if we think the benefits are good. We need for them to feel the benefits are valuable. Um, and, and I think that that would differ from school to school. But different um, institutions have incorporated and developed and established a society similar to the All-American Society at Auburn and made it specific and individualized to their constituency base. And they've seen um, also great success with it. So I'd encourage you to think about, do we need a society specific to athletics that focuses on philanthropic giving, so outside of ticket priority? All right, tips to continue cultivation, um, focus on their hot buttons and if those in fact do change over time. Um, always have an objective to, your, to each encounter you have with the prospect and then the donor and um, access always trumps an item. Uh, cultivation is still a move to the next gift. So um, keep in mind the first gift is always the smallest. I love this quote from Audrey Hepburn, nothing is impossible. The word itself says I'm possible. And you know, this business I think um, is not made for everyone. And I just want to encourage you um, and also just affirm you for you know putting yourself out there on the line. And I know we do it because we're competitive and um, we're wired that way and we like to have a scoreboard at the end of the day. You know, we're really the only unit in a department outside of the actual teams that um, have measurable um, quantitative goals. And I, I know that's a lot of pressure. Um, but I think attitude has so much to do with it. And as I mentioned before, just being the best version of you that you can be. And I listed um, just some resources, I think, that are, that are super useful. Um, obviously, I'm the past president of the um, NAD organization that is under the umbrella NACTA organization. I'm happy to share with you about how to get involved more there. It really focuses on professional development of athletic development professionals. I think it's um, been one of the most valuable um, really resources for me over the past um, decade. We will have some future webinars, so I look forward to your feedback um, on specific topics that you may want to see covered. And then I want to encourage you um, to look into the book by Jerry Smith. Um, he really is my mentor in this profession, and it's one of the best books, I believe, that out there called Success is Spelled with Three C's. And then I listed three more books um, that may be beneficial for you to look into. Um, thank you so much for your time today. I'm going to stay on for just a little bit longer if anybody does have questions. Um, we're going to attempt to turn on the audio. So keep yourself on mute unless you are posing a question, and we'll see how this goes. Okay, I hear something. All right, feel free to, to ask a question if you'd like, or um, you can also type a question um, on the pop-up on the pop-up to the on your screen from the from the GoToWebinar. It should be located in the bottom right corner. I didn't throw my voice right then. All right, let's see. It 
you don't have any questions, um, feel free to just type, you know, no questions at this time because I want to make sure I stay on long enough to answer any that you may have. See about anything with development. All right. Well, um, let me give you my email address. Um, I'd love to hear from any of you about future webinar um, topics. Uh, it's K Hargrave, H A R G R A V E, at auburn.edu. And I look forward to hearing from each of you. And thank you so much for sharing your time with me today.